everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing well. David, kick us off and let right. us and, and get us started. Good afternoon, community members, FIU alumni, students, faculty, and staff. I am Diego Garcia, and I serve as the president for the College of Business Dean Student Advisory Board and as the president for the Beta Gamma Sigma chapter here at FIU. I am currently a senior majoring in finance here at FIU Business. I have the pleasure this afternoon to introduce our panelists for the Wertheim Wisdom Wednesday and this very important discussion on leading during uncertain times, managing teams, and diversity and inclusion. I know as a student, it's wonderful to have corporate individuals involved to be able to learn from and provide us with a glimpse into the industry. I'd like to begin by sharing a few words from each of their bios. First, we have with us Ken Boyer as the America's Director of Inclusiveness Recruiting for Ernst & Young. Ken is responsible for developing and implementing a recruiting strategy that focuses on creating a diverse talent pool. Inclusiveness at Ernst & Young is defined broadly and includes gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, generational differences, Fostering an inclusive culture where all individuals can achieve their full potential is a global priority and a business imperative for Ernst & Young. Next, we have Brian Lovey. Brian is a senior trade marketing manager for Altria. His experience has been centered in sales leadership, account leadership, and talent acquisition and strategy. He is energized by leading individuals and teams alike to achieve their full potential and deliver excellent business results. Lastly, we have our moderator, Yanine San Luis. Yanine serves as the director of corporate relations for FIU Business, she is driven in her role to engage with corporate partners to discover synergy and help organizations find return on investment through philanthropic giving to FIU Business. Thank you to the panelists today involved for today's Wertheim Wisdom Wednesday and to our audience members for logging in today. Have a great panel, everyone, and I'll turn it over to Yanin to get the panel started. Awesome, thank you. Hands up for, for David, for anybody who's watching from home. Thank you so much uh, for our student leaders who are introducing us. David, thank you so much for being with us today and, and, and for that absolutely warm introduction. So once again, thank you to Ken, thank you to Brian, who have chosen to spend their afternoon with us to be able to share some of their golden nuggets with regards to leading teams through uncertainty and uncertain times it is right now during this pandemic. Before we get started, I wanted to share that this Worthine Wisdom Wednesday could not happen without the support of Herbert A. Worthine, who generously endowed a lecture series back in 1993 to bring distinguished speakers, experts, and business leadership and entrepreneurship onto campus and now online um, to address the college's students, faculty, staff, and alumni. I wanted to give a heads up to all of our panelists or, or all of our attendings here today. You might notice through this Zoom webinar feature that, um, that we have disabled the, the comment section, but if you have questions, we do have a Q&A section and we are encouraging you all to make sure that you're using that because um, it's going to get real juicy in here with all the information that we're going to be sharing and we want to make sure that we are addressing your questions okay so i'm going to begin and i'm going to say talent wins games but teamwork and intelligence wins championships michael jordan so we are navigating everyone very uncertain times these days and it's been difficult to keep the energy up and ensure that our teams are motivated throughout this time today you'll come away with ideas to come to consider implementing within your own organizations and how to pivot your teams quickly in uncertainty. We will learn how leaders of industries do this by Ken and by Brian here, and all while keeping it real and keeping it authentic. I must tell you audience, last week when we were briefing, we could have gone on and on for hours about this topic and and we just have a short hour with you all but it's going to be really exciting so let's dive right in so we before we get to the juicy stuff brian and ken i'd love for you both to paint the picture of what your organizations were doing prior to the pandemic and your response and pivot strategies for your employees after the pandemic hit so i'll kick it off to ken first and then we can go to brian Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks so much for the invite and great to be with all of you. Yeah, so I, I'm with EY. I'm actually based in our New York office, coming to you from my home office in New Jersey where I live. But, but I think for us, 
couple things that I look back on how we pivoted pretty quickly. You know, we're a large professional services firm. You don't know who we are. We have 280,000 people around the world and we serve clients um, on the assurance side, the tax side, and the consulting space. So we have a lot of people that spend a lot of time in the market, our clients, and on the road like I do. We, we reacted very quickly to this. Our, our, our US uh, CEO, or Chairman, she was wonderful in saying, essentially we got a message. In fact, I was down in Miami with all of you. I think the week um, we shut everything down. So from that point forward, she just stopped all travel. I think the board made a great decision to say, hey, there's something brewing here. The first thing and the only thing that matters is the safety of, of the EY people and professionals. So we stopped all travel and shut things down and, and really asked people to work from home pretty quickly. So that, that in hindsight was, was such a great move. I think it happened quickly before many organizations have a lot of friends who work a lot of companies and were asking, what do you mean? Why are you guys doing this? And we did it super early and it was such the right thing to do. So I think that's been helpful uh, for us as we're making it and pivoting through this, this uh, pandemic. That's absolutely wonderful. And I have to share with you because this is something that I have to say that after the conversation we had, I was just sharing with Brian prior, that prior to us getting on board, was one of the things that I love that you said that you were using some of the language that you were using in this pivoting was it's especially now is the return to office and not the return to work. I have to say, I think my colleagues, my own internal team is like, yes, yes, Yanin, we get it. We, you love that term. And I absolutely do, because I think it's such an important distinction in how you communicate with your constituencies, but also within your, the validation of your, of your internal staff, Ken. So thank you so much um, for what, you know, to providing that, that uh, pulse check and that, and that background for that. So Brian, tell us a little bit about what was Altria prior and what you all did as changes that were made throughout. Yeah, thanks, Janine, and thanks again uh, for inviting me to be a part of the conversation. Um, very similar to what Ken uh, shared is, you know, we took a very quick approach to bring a lot of our key stakeholders from uh, various leadership teams in the business uh, so to form a task force with really, first and foremost, as you mentioned, teams and culture, you know, really, you know, aside from uh, I would say aside from and in addition to our brands make us who we are and first and foremost put in the safety of our employees uh, in the forefront. Uh, that's the that's that has been the most important most most important thing for us. And so um, I think, you know, for, for from our standpoint, we've taken a very similar approach um, and, you know, making sure that uh, people uh, we're working from home largely. Uh, and making sure that people have the resources that they need uh, to do that. Um, part of what enables us to be able to do that is the technology and flexibility uh, in order to stay connected as an organization, uh, but then also making sure that we are in, you know, especially in a time of uncertainty, really thinking about how can you acknowledge the uncertainty Right? How how do you acknowledge what we don't know, and how how are we going to figure out, you know, and fill those gaps in, but then also acknowledge what we do know, uh, and you know, make the best decisions and remain in constant contact with employees. And so, uh, one of the things that we've done outside of the task force is also make resources available right on the homepage of our intranet, so that employees can easily ex access where we're at, what's changing, what we're doing with the community. So they're well informed of that, as well as the resources that are, you know, that are available to them. Um, and I'd, I'd say, you know, over time, as the situation has evolved, we've continued to evolve as well. And I think your point around, you know, being really intentional in the language and the verbiage of what we use, no one's returning to work. No one's not working, you know? And, you know, I, I see the quote and I, I may butcher it a, a bit, but like the reality is we're not working, you know, from home. It's not a one to one change where our entire worlds are different, you know, and the world around us is different. And so being very cognizant and intentional of the state and mindset and place where our employees are at uh, has been super critical. One thing that we did as well 
uh, is send out a pulse check to the entire organization to understand where they're at and really to help raise where disparities and differences in terms of uh, diff whether it's different parts of our business, but then more specifically, different employee groups from a uh, range of diversity, how they're experiencing this, what the support that they need to better help us inform and pivot, as Ken mentioned, um, to, to the specific needs of our, uh, of our employees. That's wonderful. And I'm so glad that you that you've elaborated on that. And I think that what ends up happening, you know, through this time is how do we build trust in our employees? How do we make sure that they're being kept safe and and making sure that we're using really this EI, this emotional intelligence to communicate effectively and, and how we're doing that. And so I wanted to pivot and 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 really kind of dive into the question of, it's been difficult throughout, right? We, we have a number of alums on this call this afternoon, uh, business owners, middle market owners, our faculty, our staff, and I wanted to share some internal struggles. And if you can share a little bit about the difficulty, and I'll ask the question to both, the difficulty in leading teams during this time, and what are some of the adoptive techniques that your organizations have used. So Ken, please lead us off in that. And also I have to comment, Ken, your background is fabulous. If you, you don't push boundaries, how do we break them? And such a great, great opportunity to be talking about that during this time. So please go ahead, Ken, and, and share Absolutely. with us. Absolutely, I appreciate that. That's why I wanted to make sure I had this up because I think so appropriate for what we're talking about. Um, but, but I think for us, it's been a, it's been a few things around teams. You know, you mentioned emotional intelligence. I'm a big believer in that. I, you know, I lead a number of people and I would say it has been a challenge the first month, you know, with this new normal, new abnormal, I think, of working from home and communicating via Zoom and wherever you commute or communicate. You know, I, I really openly shared with the team and we, we've had a lot of conversations. We've done virtual happy hours. We've done a lot of things, obviously, that folks are doing, but I, but I shared with the team my feelings. I think as a leader, you have to be vulnerable. Um, but I think during this time, you know, I shared initially, one, it was hard for me in the first month to sleep. Like I couldn't sleep well because there was so much anxiety relative to, you know, where are we, what are we doing and how we're going to continue to move forward. But I think really to your point earlier, keeping it real, keeping it 100 with the team saying, Hey, yeah, this is a big change for all of us. I mean, I was probably traveling at least 50% of my time. So airplanes, hotels, airports, and that all came to a screeching halt essentially. Right, and I've got team members who we've got we've got a job to do, and um, you know we've done a bunch of calls, and I said, look, we we have work to do. Now, trust is also very critical here. I think I told my team, I said, look, I trust you guys. If you have kids or you've got an appointment or you've got something to do at the house, I'm not going to be on them every single day. I know there's work to be done, and I trust that they will get it done. And so I'm not on them. I'm not a the, the managers on sitting on top of our folks. <laughs> Because I think setting that foundation of trust is really critical. I think being vulnerable through this time and sharing feelings. I've got a daughter who's at home. She's 15, doing homeschooling as well, right? So there's just a lot. I've got aging parents who are trying to, I'm caring obviously about for their welfare and, and well-being. So at the end of the day, as leaders, we're real too. And I think you've got to express that so people can appreciate and understand it. Because sometimes your team and others will put you as a leader on a pedestal. But guess what? I'm human too. I think you got to make sure you express and share that in a very vulnerable way. Awesome. I'm so happy you ha you said that. And we don't want any helicopter bro bosses during this time. I think it's I think it's the sentiment that we had shared in, in just getting together about this conversation is it's just unproductive um, to be the, that micromanaging piece of it. So Brian, you had shared that some of the things that, you know, in, in basis with leading during this difficult time and making sure that, and, and the, some of the adopted techniques, you had mentioned about the employee resource groups. And so I'd love to, for you to, um, formulate and just share with us a little bit about how that had been working for your organization. Yeah, yeah. So one big thing, I mean, we've had a lot of open and honest and authentic conversations. And I think, you know, the importance is, it, at least what I've experienced, is how critical it is that it stretches throughout 
the leadership of the organization and not just at the top, not just in the middle, you know? Um, and specifically when we think about like employee resource groups, you know, one thing that uh, two that I can think of that have really raised things at Altria is uh, we have um, multiple groups, but um, two that have held kind of real talk conversations, if you will, is our uh, uni Unify, which is our uh, black employee resource group, as well as C, which is our Hispanic um, employee resource group. And I think, you know, when we think about what's important right now, I think empathy is critically important. And the reality of it is we're all in such a different place. And I think when I like the difficulty that we face, for me, I don't have it. You know, it's just me at home, right? But that's very different than the team that I lead, you know, uh, as what, and so how it impacts me, you know, thinking of how employee resources groups are, are helping to build the skill of empathy and the capability and really telling the story of how this um, how this pandemic, if you will, is is impacting different communities with the, the Latino community, the Black community, and understanding that for the people that you lead, for the peers, the folks that you're on uh, Zoom and WebEx calls with, they may be experiencing a very different reality than you, uh, and our employee resources groups have done a great job at bringing the facts, the data, um, but then a, creating a space uh, for uh, those stories to be shared. You know, the other thing that I will also say with that though is, you know, the difficulty is in the need to be flexible. We've got a number of different resources that are available, and uh, whether it's programmatic or informal. But one thing that I have found, especially being acknowledging that I'm in a very different place than perhaps others is that flexibility cannot be left unsaid and being very explicit mm -hmm. and talking up those specific resources instead of just letting them live on the, the internet or knowing that they're out there proactively acknowledging them and if you know to Ken's point being vulnerable uh, to say hey today's a tough day for me this has been a bit challenging, or here, here's a resource that I've taken advantage of, um, really to bring to life the message and intent that we're trying to bring to the people that we're leading and not leaving it up to translation, right? And being just very explicit about, uh, about that flexibility so that they take advantage of those resources. I appreciate you saying that, and I'm going to dive into a little bit of what you said a little deeper because we we had touched upon it, Brian, in this conversation last week as we were briefing, and you talked about leaders taking action. So it wasn't just, oh, you know, you have all these Zoom meetings back to back to back, you know, don't be, you know, don't have all this Zoom fatigue or, you know what, you should really take off some time but then you see the leader not taking off time. I would love for you um, to, to speak to that because the leaders taking action and, and Ken, please feel free to chime in as well. Leaders taking action and actually taking advantages of the benefits that the company is providing and the standard is what's going to have that trickle down that domino effect. And so wanted to just kind of get from you all that sentiment and how do you sustain that to keep you know, the employees motivated? Yeah, I think, you know, being um, people, people hear what you say, but they very more so see what you do, you know, and uh, just being aware of the fact that if you're preaching and sharing all this flexibility, however, you're working through nonstop and putting, cap, you know, not respecting people's time and ability for them to think and breathe and realize you're staring at a screen like all day right and um, you know some some specific things that we've done in different parts of our organization uh, that i can think of is you know in our talent acquisition group you know we brought our team together to have conversation but then as a management team we talked through very specific things that hey it may not work across the enterprise but what could we do formally to uh, bring flexibility. And so we implemented uh, a couple periods during the week of dark hours. Not that people aren't working, but like we just made an agreement within our team that, 
hey, as much as possible, we are going to commit to not scheduling meetings during these blocks of time to make sure that people have the ability to get work done, to think, to process, to take care of home, frankly, right, and being very explicit about that. You know, another example as well that I thought was, um, was actually really cool but somewhat subtle is for our, our field sales organization where we have uh, a ton of folks uh, a part of that. Um, we had an introductory kind of uh, call and video for their return to retail plan. And in that call, we had our president and CEO uh, of our sales organization and one of our region vice presidents. And you could see for, uh, for, for, for Scott, who's our CEO of that group, you could see his calendar on the screen. And it was very explicit that his lunch, he had lunch blocked off and time blocked off with his daughter each day, you know, mm -hmm. uh, during that time period. And those are the things that I think about, like, we probably think about. Of course, as a people leader, we're okay with, it's implied, but really modeling the flexibility, modeling the behavior, uh, you know, that we really want our people to, to take into account. Just knowing that you can say all you want around flexibility, but people are also going to watch how you operate. And that's mm -hmm. really, really important. And it gives them kind of that secondary permission to take what they need as well. Wonderful. Ken, please share uh, some of your, any, any thoughts that you had about that as far as implementing um, and, and making, leading by example. Yeah, no, Brian, great point. I do think, you know, for me, it's been very similar. You know, you can go nuts with the Zoom stuff, like every day meeting, all of a sudden calendars are filling up. But I do think you've got to be regimented in, in how you show up and, and when you shut your laptop down. Like, so I just personally, you know, I make it a point at the end of the day, shut my laptop off, I close it, I don't come back. And I'm not sending my team messages unless it's something urgent. You know, in the wee hours of the day or night or, or on the weekends, right? I really try to create boundaries because Brian, you're right, to your point, if I'm starting to send messages over the weekend, they're gonna feel obligated to, or maybe not, but maybe they'll feel obligated to uh, respond. I don't want that. You know, I, I've, you know, we had a meeting scheduled Thursday, of a team meeting, we're trying to talk a lot more often had a meeting scheduled just the way it fell on the calendar this Thursday at four o'clock. I looked up and realized it was a holiday weekend. So I, of course I canceled my like, guys cancel. We're not going to do this. You know, enjoy the long weekend. We get Friday off. So uh, enjoy the long weekend. Leading by example is critical. I think setting up boundaries, really important. Uh, how you go to your day as well. And, and you got to You got to walk it. I mean, too many people just talking it, but you got to walk it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that one of the things that we had talked about is, is, and here's the thing, audience members, you have had so many things that you could have done today and so many Zoom meetings. We are honored and privileged that you're joining in on this conversation. So I wanted to just make sure that you, that you had a chance to ask questions. So throughout, as we continue the conversation, make sure to check out on the bottom, the Q&A tab to ask some questions, and I'll be happy to facilitate those to our panelists. So Ken, I think we've been struggling with work-life balance. This has been uh, the just every single year and, and for years and years, this has been a battle for corporate employees throughout the world. You know, what's this fine tuning of the balance? And I feel like more and more productivity with being at home and ro working remotely um, through this pandemic um, despite everything that's going on, it's still very high. But there is that balance that you said of shutting down that, you know, computer at the end of the day and, and keeping those things focused. I was curious about your thoughts on encouraging this uh, from within and within your leadership teams and how, how you all monitor that. Just the workload itself or just the workload itself and how you're encouraging your team members, um, your leaderships and your supervisors to encourage their teams to do so as well. Yeah, hopefully the examples we set are, are something that will permeate, you know, through the organization. I think that's, that's what we certainly hope. But I think taking advantage of the time, you know, I, I just talked about what I do. Like, so to the point around lunch, you know, Brian, you shared one of your executives has lunch scheduled. I mentioned I've got a daughter. I try really to have lunch with her. So she's doing the virtual schooling thing, sophomore in high school. So I try to have lunch with her and I'll, I'll talk about these things. I think the virtual happy hours or there'll be times when we have meetings set up to talk about work, but I get a sense that 
you know what, we're not going to talk about work. We're going to talk and ask how are, how are people doing? And then we've, you know, I've done it where we had a whole discussion on what are you going through? What are you feeling? Let, let's, let's be open. Let's share things that are happening. The other thing around this trust, the, the thing that our, that our leadership team did, um, our, our CEO, our CEO, she said this early on, this is about the firm doing what we can to save jobs. Mm -hmm. Number one priority is our people. And number two is, is saving jobs, our jobs. And so I think setting the right tone, I think really organizations, cultures are being challenged right now. I think the real, your real culture will come out in times of crises. Mm. I think it is about leadership in these times. And, you know, from our, our CEO and our board all the way through that the leadership has been incredible. And personally, as a leader in the firm, I, I try to emulate what we do. They're setting the right tone at the highest levels. I think in coming upon us as leaders as well to make sure we're setting that tone and carrying that down throughout our teams and, and hopefully it all permeates through leadership, leadership by example and, and people know when it's real or when it's, pardon my friends, BS. <laughs> Absolutely. I think it, it's what ends up happening here is the authenticity and pieces. People now know how to filter through that and the actions really do speak louder than words in the way that we address the culture issues. And, and I love that you said that the real culture will come through. And, and it's, I think it's sink or swim during this time as well as leaders and, and the viability in, um, in, in our companies and what we're gonna see through. So Brian, you know, we talked about a little bit about those qualities, right? And the qualities necessary in leaders and managers and what they should be adopting at this time. And I would love for you to just speak about some of that and how, you know, in that culture framework that Ken had just shared is how are these leadership um, skills and how are these personality traits going to now really evolve over the, the, the course of time and how are, how are these things going to come out? So I'd love for you to share some thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll be honest, Janine. I, I don't know that there are any new qualities that are, are raising, but I think there are specific ones, though, that become now even much more important, you know, and I talked about empathy, you know, previously. I think that is, you know, to, to Ken's point, people know when you're being authentic and you're really, you know, trying to seek to understand where they're at uh, or you're trying to check a box, you know. Um, I think empathy is, you know, been, been really important. You know, I think the other piece um, that also somewhat t uh, dovetails into the previous question around work-life balance is being flexible and specifically around what our priorities are. You know, um, we were in a, there is a, there's a truth to, there was a pre-COVID world and there's a post-COVID world in terms of where we're at. So, you know, being very explicit around what is the most important work that we have right now? What's the same? What's changed? What needs to come off the plate? In some cases, what may need to come on the plate, you know, uh, in our talent acquisition space? knowing that the world is vastly different, there's some priorities that just cannot carry the same weight that they did before. And there's some things that were not at all on the radar that we need to accelerate uh, in order to deliver, you know? And I think that those are the types of things that leaders should be doing regardless, right? Um, but I think it's just become that much more exaggerated of like, there's a good chance that if you're doing exactly what you were doing before the pandemic, there's probably a miss. There's probably something that needs to come off. There's something that needs to come on. There's something that needs to be turned up or down, you know? Um, but I think really empathy, um, flexibility um, in regards to the business, because the reality is we do have things that we're all accountable for and that we got to deliver, you know? Um, and so, you know, being, being okay uh, with that, but then also a level of vulnerability. Um, I think now um, more than ever, it's so critically important that, uh, you know, we do whatever we need to do as uh, people leaders or organizational leaders to really show um, us our, ourselves as people um, beyond just a, being a manager, if that makes sense. Uh, and so that to, to help make sure that our employees can do the same for themselves. Yeah, okay. can I just comment on that? It just Absolutely. made me think about something, Brian. I think for me, 
it's given me time personally to just to recalibrate, like to take a deep breath. Um, because what I found is I've been running so hard. I think a lot of us have all the time. And you just, you know, you got thing after thing, thing to do, never have time to, this is me, maybe not you guys, but never have time to really focus. This has given me time to pause, um, to recalibrate a bit. And to your point, kind of realign some priorities, right? What, what should we, con you know, start, stop, continue that kind of model? What should we do differently? And I think it's, in that sense, it's been helpful for me as a leader to one, my, my difference will be when we do come out of this and we will, is to make sure I allow myself time to think mm. and not run from fire to fire, issue to issue, thing to thing. Mm, that's, so, that's so important. So just to pivot from the leadership standpoint into a, an employee standpoint, and I mean, we're all employees, but in, and we are leaders in our own right, but one of the things I wanted to share is how do we keep motivated? How are, I would love to hear about your routine um, you can even throw in some self-care if you'd like to, what you do, but what is it that, um, how do we keep motivated day to day, right? And, and especially in this level of uncertainty, a lot of things like down here in South Florida this week, we just opened up um, for 50% our restaurants here in, in Miami. Um, so there's obviously a hesitation, excitement, but also hesitation of coming back. Um, but wanted to ask you all, how is it that you stay motivated during this time? What are the things that you feel that keep you grounded? You want to start, Brian? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. I mean, um, I like to say I'm getting up and working out every morning, um, but that wouldn't be <laughs> uh, keeping it real. Um, but, <laughs> <Good>. um, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but the reality of it is, is, is finding some sense of routine, you know. You know, for me, just being in, I got to eat, eat breakfast every morning, you know, take care of myself. Um, but then also like making sure that I'm taking a lunch, uh, not necessarily eating that at my desk, um, you know, and actually just looking out the window, you know, get, sitting outside and eating if I can. Um, you know, those, those small things I think are really important. Um, but when I think about also for my team, it's also just making sure that we are celebrating and acknowledging work and progress and wins. There's no win that's too small to be celebrated, mm. you know, and to acknowledge, right? And so, and also the fact of like some of the outputs of work, um, you know, right now, uh, maybe in a uh, in the previous world, may not have been as big a deal, but they're big lifts right now. I mean, and. I think, you know, I speak for myself, I was assuming the same for Ken and so many on the phone of like the, the, the level of output that people are producing in the midst of like the mental energy that's being taken, taken up by their world. I mean, is, is, is truly amazing and outstanding. And I think being very explicit, specific and timely of those recognitions uh, of people's progress, um, constant communication of where are we going and as things pivot, you know, um, just being clear around that communication. I think those are aspects that keep employees running and keep them motivated. Um, everyone, you know, I'll just speak for me. I mean, it's really important for me to feel like I'm a part of something bigger than just, you know, the, the you know, specific deliverable. Uh, and so the more that we can stress that the importance of you know of folks work and then appreciation of their contribution um not just as an employee but as an employee in a global pandemic um you know i think is is really important um to keep people motivated and uh, and coming back uh, but then also being clear of and having a sense and pulse and from an eq standpoint of when do people need to breathe you know um so that they can take the breather, take a little bit of time, not just to relax, but what I have found is when I am taking the time that I need, I'm able to come back and deliver even that much more, you know, and be much more productive than, you know, the zombie that I might be if I'm just going 12 hours straight. Right, hey, that, that's great. A few things I would add, I mean, personally, you know, one of the benefits the firm is offering a lot, we're very focused on our people, mindfulness. We have a number of folks in the firm who are trained to, I guess, be mindfulness coaches, if you will, 
So it's a form of meditation. So trying to just spend time, like quiet time for myself. I try to do that every day for a little bit of time, just to pause and reflect. Um, with, with the wife and daughter, we, we try to go for a daily walk, weather permitting up here in New Jersey, but we do try to get out because Brian, like you, my, my workout routine is gone. So I try to at least get out and do some walks, I think. So that's what I try to do personally. Uh, the, the other piece though, I think for me or for work, and, and hopefully for a lot of you who are listening, I think it's a great time to reflect, you know, kind of what's your why. Like mm. why, why is it what you do? Why does it matter to you? Like in the role for me around trying to, you know, ensure that EY is the most diverse firm around, like the passion I have toward diversifying our organization, setting and executing our strategy with my team, like my, my why is there. And so I try to think about why am I doing what I'm doing? I touch base to a lot of people around the firm and other organizations, but what's your why? I think some people, the reality is, right? Some people as they're reflecting on their why, maybe at the end of this pandemic say, you know what, I'm not passionate about what I'm doing mm -hmm. and the role that I'm in. Yeah. And so I think you've got to use this time wisely. And on the back end of this, if you're not passionate and if you can't get self-motivated by the work you're doing, I think you need to ask yourself some really important questions. Um, but for me, and hopefully my team, I know some of them are on, and I try to remind them why and what we do is so important, right? For that high school kid that we've given a scholarship to or that that intern, we, you know, we are have we have thousands of interns. Now, Brian, you got interns. Thousands of interns starting in a month, and it's going to be all virtual. I've got a team of people who are building, as we speak, a virtual internship experience for thousands of interns. Like, so the contributions that they're giving, Brian, to your point, the work they're doing, but the why. The why is we're going to have a bunch of kids coming in here, young people with internships, and who are going to be part of this firm in the future. So what is your why? And is your why enough to give you passion to continue in times of difficulty like we're in now? That's fantastic. And I'm, I'm, I'm great. I'm so grateful for you to share that and, and share the why. I'm also extremely grateful for both of your groups and, and, and the corporate partnerships that you've had with us, with, with, the, with the College of Business at FIU. And, and, I, sh and I share this with you because you picked a, you, you both said something that I, I wanted to elaborate on and I'm, I'm getting flooded with questions, which is great. We're going to, we're going to be uh, answering your questions very soon. Keep them coming. They're right down there in the Q and a section. But one of the questions you mentioned, Ken, just now in the recruitment process, and I wanted to just address that because the, the question is the following. Can you speak to how COVID-19 will change recruitment? Or recruiting for new positions, hiring, or onboarding. And I know that you've, uh, I know Brian, midway through the spring semester, you all had to pivot completely from an in-person internship to a, to a virtual internship. So I, I would love to get a sense for both of you and what you're anticipating now about to launch an internship program in, in the summer, but how you feel recruitment in general is going to change after this. Start, Brian? Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, we 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 were testing a a spring internship with actually uh, FIU uh, student leaders uh, while like in the midst of COVID changing, and I mean, we had to pivot on the spot, and we have some team members, you know, uh, from from that team uh, down in Florida that I think are on the call as well, and they were, you know super critical in, in being able to figure out how do we pivot that. To Ken's point though, when you think about like just understanding why we're doing what we do um, in terms of delivering for these students, the critical learning experiences that they're, you know, that, that they're seeking. Um, but then also from a business standpoint, um, you could make the argument that, man, is that the most important thing right now is our, you know, our internship program. But when you think about it, it's a critical, component of our talent pipeline and get bringing in the leaders that we need long term and so absolutely that work is important uh, and we had a ton of folks that really focused in on rebuilding uh, uh, similar you know similar to, to Ken's point um, how, how I see it changing and impacting recruitment and onboarding and things of the future I mean it's really forced us to challenge some 
you know, orthodoxies of uh, in, in, in that we've had, um, and some of which that we've already started moving down the path of last year of does, you know, do you always have to be 100% in person? Um, you know, is there a better way uh, to mix uh, virtual and different touch points and frankly, meet candidates where they are, you know? Uh, and so, you know, um, I'd say that has expanded well beyond our university recruiting and thinking through how do we leverage technology um, to, frankly, be more mindful of our candidates' time to be able to deliver outcomes and um, decisions to candidates in a quicker way. Um, and then also, look, most of the folks on the phone are business people. Uh, and so being mindful of our business spend as well, um, I think is, uh, is, uh, is critically important. Um, you know, I think what you will find and what we're finding and frankly have to live now is um, you can be virtual and still have a human connection, you know, uh, and figuring out ways to do that um, outside of physically shaking someone's hand, um, I think is really important. I will also say, you know, I received a question way, uh, it was probably, um, you know, uh, a couple of years ago uh, from, from a group of folks, uh, not at Altria, but other stakeholders, and to say, well, hey, as you guys are considering, you know, doing more virtual interviews, uh, and virtual touch points, don't you lose that, you know, that ability when someone walks in the room and you just, you just that, oh, you know? And so, yeah, you kind of do. Um, but when you really dial that back, what is that? Is that, that, you know, that's bias, you know, that's your first impression, you know, first impression bias of like, I just get this vibe from this person. And cer certainly look, that, that is important. That is real. So I acknowledge that, but I think it's also caused us to just really focus in on candidates, their skills, their experiences, and what they bring to the table. Um, and that can be done in, a, uh, you know, a wide range of ways. So, you know, I, I see, you know, much of what we're living today uh, as being something that lives well on post-COVID um, and, you know, you know, as we come out of this, which is really good. Yeah, no, no, great points. I, similar, I think we're, we're certainly building the whole virtual experience, as I mentioned, for our interns, even, frankly, our internal learning. So as you can appreciate, we do a lot of learning for our people. We're building all virtual learning. So I think this, this pandemic has accelerated a lot of things that were already in motion. And I think, Brian, to your point, we probably had a number of folks, probably even me, but some folks who were you know, used to the old way of doing things, air quotes, for those of you might be on the phone, I think this has accelerated the change in business, right? To move to a virtual platform and, and you don't have a choice to say, I'm not so sure we need to shake the hand, Brian, to your point. Guess what? We have no choice. So right now we've got to do this. So I think it's going to allow us to, to really in, in live ways to prove out this virtual recruiting, how it's going to happen. It's going to actually allow us to have more and greater reach to a lot of schools across the country, the world, even that, from that standpoint, because, this is showing, and we, we've been doing this before, but not on this scale. You may not have to physically be on campus, right, to do what we do. Now, we, of course, when things lighten up and schools are open, there'll be some of that, but clearly there are gonna be some changes um, that because this thing has gotten accelerated and we're gonna prove that, guess what? We can deliver people, we can hire great talent uh, just through things like Zoom or virtual, whatever it might be. That's wonderful. And, and, and if, I could, if, if I could, you need to just add one thing in okay. specific to like our program, our internship program. And I think this applies, though, beyond just internship programming. I think the way that our team has a, approached the mindset was less of how do we take a program that today they come into the office or they're in the field and participating and leading in sales? And how do we make that virtual? to really dial back and see what are we trying to accomplish? What are, we, you know, what are the key things that we're trying to deliver, whether it be experiences for the, our, our, our folks, the things that we're trying to learn, uh, the things that we need to see and know to make decisions, and then build something that best answers those questions in the environment that we're in versus trying to take something, you know, take a, 
VCR and put it into a Blu-ray player, right? It doesn't work, right? And so ultimately, we're just trying to see and tell a great story. So really being okay with going back and saying, what are we trying to accomplish? And knowing what's different now, what's the best way to accomplish that? So being really goal-driven um, and, and versus, you know, focusing on converting one thing to now just being digital, if that makes sense. Yeah, by the way, those of you who don't know what a VCR is, please <laughs> Google it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, what are floppy disks again and, and those kind of <laughs> instruments? Um, so I, we are, um, we're wrapping up on time here and I want to, I want to be, I want to answer some of the questions that have been, that have been asked, but before we get to that piece, I have one last question for you all to, to answer is really, I'd like for you to pull out your crystal balls at, at this time. I know you have them somewhere back here, um, to pull out your crystal balls, but I want you to think about, I want to know what your predictions are for this, uh, quote unquote, return to normal? And um, what are the habits that you think that you'll, you'll be taking in to your new normal? And um, what do you think the future will be of this pandemic? We, we thought about, uh, about this, but last week we also talked a little bit about the silver linings um, and some of the things that, that were really encouraging that we, we want to take in with us. So please feel free to, to to just share your thoughts on that. Ken, go ahead first and, and tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's um, slowing down. I think what I realized, as I said earlier, I was been running so hard so fast. And, and now I know I've got to pause and slow down. I think because that just the clarity of what that brings, uh, as I am finding time to just reflect and challenge what you're doing, why you're doing it, and in which direction I need to go. I, I will forever pause and allow myself to slow down because uh, I think that's absolutely critical. I think the other, the other side of it is I remind myself that, you know, this too shall pass. We'll, we'll get through this, but I think it's important to look back and understand the lessons. I've been through a lot of, you know, 9-11, you know, I was on an airplane uh, that morning, um, I, long story, um, obviously the, the crisis of 08. I've been through a number of things and we do get through it because we're resilient as people. I think it reminds me to continue to be hungry, continue to be resilient. Uh, and again, the work that we're doing in the DNI space, the team and I and others, I know how important this is. I see some of the disparities that are out there in some of these communities, whether it's access to technology or Wi-Fi or uh, there are just so many, so many things from a bias standpoint uh, and from an inequity standpoint. We've got to continue to push harder to make sure that we, we really have a, a world that's a lot more inclusive and, and certainly a lot more equitable, equitable um, other than the thinking and approach. So those are a few things. Great, Brian? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Ken, your background is great. Because I think about like boundaries, um, false boundaries, you know, self-imposed um, things that, you know, we thought maybe we had to, that just never existed, you know, um, you know, of, of, do you, do you, does everything have to be a meeting? You know, is it a phone call? Is it a Microsoft Teams message? Is it an email? You know, um, does it need to happen at all? Right. Uh, and challenging that, you know, I think one thing also that um, has been interesting is, and I think that we just have to be focused in on is like seeking out the learnings. If we come out of this and we haven't learned something or we're operating the same way, we have missed a golden opportunity uh, to grow and develop. Uh, and, that can, and, and, and that's not always necessarily easy, right? But I think if we look for it, we'll find, you know, what we can learn and adjust to. Um, you know, a lot of folks, you know, kind of take the tenet of like, man, celebrating the family and culture of their company uh, and how supportive that people have been in this pandemic. Well, man, that is a failure if we do not continue that culture and community, even if things, you know, even if and when things clear up, right? Uh, and so all these things that we mentioned of how important it is to be operate as a leader and how important it is to be flexible and care for our people, uh, we call it the Altria way, 
you know, and one of the main tenets is we care for each other. We rise to the challenge together. And if a global pandemic is, you know, something that helps to really pull that out of people, that's great. But if that's where it ends, that's a failure, you know. And I think, you know, I just would recommend for all the leaders on the on the phone is to really challenge yourself to to look at how you have adapted and led differently, how others have led differently with you, and really be intentional as things clear up to not return to normal, to return to better, if I, if you know, if you will. Thank you so much. So as we wrap up, um, we have a couple more minutes for questions. So let's dive into them and, and feel free to, to jump in um, one take uh, one question and so on. So I'm going to talk a little bit on the diversity and inclusion standpoint for a second because we do have a question about um, you know, racial disparities during this time during the, the pandemic. And this question is as follows. How are your individual companies responding to the growing racial disparities, perhaps amongst Asians and Blacks that are experiencing during, that they're experiencing during this pandemic? Are you adding any mental health days for these groups? Are you doing anything um, different or special? Um, wanted to just, if anybody wants to take that first question. Yeah, Brian, I can comment. So yeah, we're, we're doing a number of things. I think certainly within the firm, we've got professional networks for each of those groups. Uh, in fact, we have a call next week with the Black Professional Network speaking about some of those items. Uh, we've had a call with our Pan-Asian community already talking about some of the challenges there. And then personally, I'm working with a number of external organizations. So organizations like NAVA, Alpha, and Descend, a lot of business organizations that are focused on certain ethnic groups but really working with them, frankly, I'm a consultant by background, helping them consult and helping them through their way of this pandemic. Like what, what does tomorrow look like for them? And so a lot of us are using our skills. We have a huge, you know, a huge outreach in the communities that we, we all live in and work in using our skills to help small business, you know, down to the medical side, you name it, but just to really help entrepreneurs navigate this space in these communities, because that's really key. Okay. Thank you, Ken. So the next question kind of revolves around um, the loss of a job and what to do during around this pandemic. So the, the question goes as follows. What advice can you provide to people who have lost their jobs in this time that do have a passion for what they do, but are faced now with the challenge of finding a good opportunity due to the COVID crisis and the downsizing of many companies? I hear this person, I was a recession graduate, and so it was very difficult during that time. But anybody who wants to step in and, and answer that question uh, regarding what are the, some of the skill sets that they can be doing or how do you stand out during that? during this time? So a couple quick thoughts on that one. I, I would say, man, I know hard times for a lot of people. Um, a couple things I would suggest. One, don't forget about your network. The fact that you're on this call, I mean, obviously you're pretty connected. Make sure you leverage a network as much as possible. That's gonna be critical. There's a lot of online education that's happening now that use this time wisely to improve and enhance your skills, right? So whether it's a technology focused thing, but do some online learning and development because I think what employers are going to look for, we know a lot of people unfortunately have been impacted. But what, we, what we'd like to see is that during this time, you're looking to get better and to improve your skills. So I'd say use this time wisely, leverage your network for sure. Um, and you've got, to, you've got to stay encouraged. I know it's difficult. I've got family members who've been impacted and just trying to get ready. Um, also, I know some entrepreneurs on. This could be an interesting time, right? I mean, obviously it's a risk. But if you've been thinking about becoming an entrepreneur or if you're an entrepreneur, where, where does tomorrow bring you and what kind of service can you offer, right? And so I, I've been coaching a number of entrepreneurs and I said, you've got to look for the gray of tomorrow because they're, they're going to be a next wave of entrepreneurs that come through this because things that are needed. Use this time to think about where can you play in that gray space to create your next opportunity, your next company, your next product or service. Wonderful. Thanks, Ken. So one of these other questions is about um, really going back into the dial, dial on, uh, moving the dial on diver diversity and inclusion with company goals. And how do you foresee, and anybody who wants to take this, um, how do you foresee COVID moving the dial on diversity and inclusion with company goals, specifically with understanding 
employee specific needs like childcare or geography for, for remote workers, perhaps recruiting, any of those um, thoughts that you might want to think about? Yeah, I think, you know, um, to, to start with where you finish with your question of like remote working, um, we're all doing it right now. And I think some, you know, it's forced us to consider where jobs that we previously said, hey, you need to be physically here or you need to move here, you know. Um, and frankly, that's harder for, for some folks based on their situation. Um, I think we're seeing in a lot of cases that that may not necessarily be true, you know, um, or, or you could telecommute, you know, there's, there's other options. I think, you know, to the point earlier of like, we're forced to live those options. Uh, and with that prove out their viability. Uh, and so um, I think that, you know, in some cases opens up broadly the candidate pool and the possibilities for, uh, for folks that may not have had, kind of the same level of opportunity in the past. Um, I think also, um, just frankly, from a recruiting standpoint, um, it does allow us the capability uh, and um, frankly, it creates a bit of a new norm of connecting with folks. Um, like the reality is we cannot be everywhere, um, you know, for everyone. Uh, and so I think it, you know, causes us to, e to even further stress that where we physically are located and doing recruiting uh, to dial in on those partnerships, but then also really take advantage of the, the fact that everyone right now is used to, you know, connecting at, you know, very quickly, becoming used to connecting with people in a very, very different way. And those things that we may have been hesitant about in the past, it's a great opportunity for us to lean into, to bring in diversity of thought, to bring in different, um, different groups and backgrounds, uh, in a in a really efficient way. Great. And last question before we wrap up is regarding on the recruiting side and and forecasting for the future. Is do you think how should job descriptions be modified for remote for remote positions during this time, or perhaps some of the positions that you are already recruiting for? adding that component of must be able to work remotely. Do you see any of those things changing for a new profile for, for new positions as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing it right now. We're, we're you know, as we're placing and posting different jobs and positions, really questioning, as I mentioned, like, do you really have to physically be there, you know, uh, or, or is there a, travel component that could satisfy that in-person need, you know, um, and not just looking at it, then including that in the actual job posting, you know, uh, so that people can know and see, and that doesn't have to be a question where they self-select out based on what they knew to be true in the past, you know, how can we just be really clear about, hey, how we're thinking about the role now uh, so that people don't, so, don't self, you know, self-select out. Another thing that we also do internally is we run our job descriptions through uh, some different resources. Textio is one that we particularly use to make sure and evaluate the language uh, that we're using to make sure it doesn't skew in any one direction, whether it's too masculine, feminine, or, um, you know, um, you know, that would be kind of strike a different, you know, group in a different way. Um, those are just some um, practical things that we've been doing uh, to address that. That's wonderful. Well, everyone, we are at time. I can't believe how quickly this went. I, I know and we know everyone and, and our audience members that you could have been doing so many different things at this time. And you've probably, this might be the sixth, seventh or eighth Zoom meeting of the day. So we are so grateful that you've um, lent in your ears um, to hear this and to watch this with us as we learned how to manage teams. And so just to recap our discussion a little bit for, for our audience members. So we learned a little bit about that real culture, your real culture, your true culture will indeed come out in this time. And so that leadership is so important and so critically important for you to 
be aware of, the culture fields. We also understood about boundaries and we illustrated that with Ken's background. If you don't push the boundaries, how do you know if you break them? But more importantly, how do you set boundaries for yourself as it relates to routine, your own balance, your own well-being? How do you stay motivated during this time is going to really go hand in hand with the boundaries that you set. We talked a little bit about celebrating wins and celebrating and appreciating the team and what they're doing from big wins to small wins and getting up every morning and getting dressed and coming in front of the computer is a big win to celebrate for everyone during this time. So making sure that you're adopting those celebrations of wins. And lastly, and I thought this was my, one of my favorite points that we mentioned, we talked about modeling the way. So it's not just making sure that we're having policies and procedures in place in our companies and in our corporations about the, the best behaviors or the best practices during working times in, in remote work and, pro and providing benefits like mental health days or taking time off, but it's also about leaders modeling the way and doing so as well. So if you know, you're asking your teams to shut off at 5 p.m., but you're answering, you're the leader, emails at 11, it's anticipated, you know, that the team's perception would be you have to answer that. So modeling that behavior in the way is so important during this time. So thank you so much. I, I so appreciate the, conversa the conversation, Brian and Ken. Thank you for your time and for being so gracious with your wisdom and your knowledge. Um, I am looking forward to having you both back on campus and doing this live for everyone and, and really taking a look at post COVID, what leadership, diversity and inclusion and what the future of business is gonna look like. So thank you everyone. I'm Janine San Luis, your, your Director of Corporate Relations at FIU Business. Thank you for joining us for our Worthine Wisdom Wednesday series. Have a beautiful day and, stay, and we'll stay connected. Take care.